thanks a lot to the LMS group and especially to Dr. Laurent for uh, introducing us and inviting me here. I've had a great few hours already and hope to continue talking to a lot of you through the rest of the day. Um, so to give you a broad overview of what I'm going to be talking about, my background really is in experimental mechanics and I really love talking to the theoreticians to get a sense of what my experiments really mean. Um, a lot of my work involves understanding materials at different scales and specifically at short time scales. So we'll be talking about two stories, really two specific problems. One from the plasticity of metals and second from ferroelectric materials. Right? Um, I don't know if there is a very formal format for the seminar, but uh, for me, if anyone has questions during the talk right away, if you need a question that needs, that needs to be answered, please feel free to just raise your hand. And speak. Right? Um, so uh, to give you a broad overview, I just put a length scale plot here to give you a broad overview of why people like to study materials at the extremes. I'll go into a little more careful definition of what I mean by extremes. Uh, but this is an example of Earth, right? So essentially, you're talking about kilometers length scales, and typically this is treated as an intersonic crack or a crack that's propagating inside a heterogeneous medium uh, at different speeds, right? and this is how. Uh, modern experimental mechanics has actually made strides in understanding how earthquakes decay. A second example is from a car crash. We um, we probably see this not hopefully not every day, but we see this often enough to realize that this is an important problem to solve. And the real question here is how does a material fail under extreme loading conditions when you have a crash, when you have high strain rate impact, millisecond, microsecond, nanosecond time scales. Um, a third example is actually something that um, is a little less intuitive for those of us uh, who live on Earth. This is really from a hypervelocity impact. And the, the fundamental problem here is you have a structure that's hurtling through space, and you have these little micrometeorites that impact the material at kilometers per second velocities. Right? Um, and this is an example of a canonical experiment. So you have a steel ball, which is a few millimeters in diameter, that's impacted in aluminum plate. And what you see is the steel ball has actually removed a lot of material in here, but then you see this failure surface has opened up at the back. This is called spall. And the reason the failure surface opens up at the back, where seemingly no material has penetrated, is because of the fact that you have interacting shock waves. And a final example that I will touch upon towards the end of the talk is in energy generation. And the idea came up a long time ago when people said, I detonate something, I basically have an explosive behind a ferroelectric sample or an electroactive sample, and you essentially use this. So you have a, a charge which basically detonates something. You have a PZE sample, so this is a classic piezoelectric or ferroelectric sample, and you use that to generate very large amounts of current simply because you generate charges in microsecond, nanosecond time scales. So these are the scales of problems that are useful. And so if we go into a little more detail, what do we not see when we look at materials at extremes? Um, and I'm going to define this in a little more detail now. So what is an extreme event? We're talking about large amplitude external stimuli in a broad sense at extremely short time scales. Now, this does not have to be an and here. So it could be just large amplitude stimuli or extremely short time scales. But the problem that we will be talking about today is what happens when you apply large amplitude stimuli at short time scales. So in a simple canonical experiment, you can imagine that you have a piece of material and you're applying a velocity bounding condition to this piece of material. You have waves that propagate inside the medium. These are discrete phenomena that propagate inside the medium. And then you have regions of heterogeneous regions of plasticity, failure, whatnot, that nucleate inside your material. All of these propagate at finite velocities. And so essentially, most of these dynamic phenomena are very heterogeneous in nature. So this is an example of a canonical experiment where um, a steel plate was impacted by a projectile. And what you see is a whole range of different mechanisms that kick in. Our objectives are going to be in trying to isolate some of these mechanisms, very specific mechanisms, and understand how they behave. So you have shear bands, which are regions of intense localization of shear strain. You have voids, basically what happens before those fall failure events that I was talking about. You have phase boundary kinetics that kick in, um, and you have plastic flow and cracks. Inside the medium. So you have a whole bunch of different mechanisms. It's very complicated to understand all of these mechanisms inside a single experiment. So we try to isolate some of these mechanisms. So like I said, this is a, a length scale, time scale plot of the heterogeneous phenomena that occur during these extreme events. So at the macroscopic scale, you have an orientation of a crystal structure or a distribution of orientations of crystal structure. 
in a polycrystalline material that doubles the material response. Um, at smaller length scales, you have heterogeneous deformation. These are examples of shear localization or shear bands inside magnesium at high strain rates. Um, you have defects that propagate inside the medium, and these would be the specific types of problems we talk about today. And finally, you have the structure of these defects that governs how fast these defects move inside the system. Right? And we'll discuss why we want to understand how fast these individual defects move inside the system through the top. So um, for those of you who have not had an introduction to um, basic thermomechanics and, and looking at phase diagrams and things like that, you have a free energy density. Imagine you have a, a plutonium potato, as some people would like to call it. And then you have a given structure of the materials. In this case, I just put a periodic arrangement of atoms. Right? So you have a free energy potential for the system. And when you apply a stimuli, you have a potential energy of the system. And the minima basically governs the local the state of material. The problem we'll be talking about today is the coexistence of phases, where you have two different phases or multiple different phases that coexist inside your system. Um, now, the definition of phases is a little loose here because we're dealing with anything with different types of configurations or different um, uh, definition fields. Uh, in some cases, we'll just be talking about uh, difference in electrical polarization, for example. Right? So when you have that kind of interface, you have a double well potential where you have two minima to the potential. And when you apply an external stimuli, you tilt your double well potential towards a stable configuration. And when that happens at transient time scales, you have a motion of this thing. You have motion this interface between them. A lot of the problems we'll be talking about today will actually involve um, this phenomena at a fundamental scale. But we'll be looking at much shorter time space, like I mentioned before. So um, again, um, you can look at this problem or the, this, this nature of interfaces and different configurations inside your material uh, in a wide variety of different problems. The first one will what we will we will be discussing during the first um, half of the talk. This is in material strength, and what you see as these heterogeneous mechanisms are kick in. These are called deformation twins that you see in a lot of plastically deforming materials, especially in hexagonal close packed crystal systems. Uh, the second example is again something we'll be talking about today. This is in multiphysics, these are ferroelectric materials where you have again heterogeneous regions of deformation. And this is simply characterized by a difference in mechanical and electrical properties across the interface. The third example is from shape memory alloys, where essentially you apply, you have thermomechanical conditions that you apply to the sample and it has a shape memory effect. So you control the temperatures as such you control the deformation of the medium. And the way it does that at the microscopic length scale is through the formation of these complex microstructures. The fourth example is actually something that uh, Laura introduced me to, in fact, a few years back, and I found this extremely exciting, where you use this in biology and tissue remodeling. And the idea is this, this, this is an experimental image where you put two active particles inside um, a tissue medium, right? In, inside a fibrous medium. And when you excite these active particles, they interact by the formation or by the densification of the fibrous medium inside it. And people treat that as a phase, as a different phase inside the medium. So like I said, the concept of phase is very different from how we treat this in material science. It's more of a different configuration that you talk about. So like I said, we'll be talking about two specific problems today. One from viscoplastic deformation of magnesium. Uh, and the basic question we're going to be asking ourselves is what happens when you take magnesium and deform it at high strain rates, so extremely short time scales. And we'll be looking at this in the context of a specific mechanism called deformation twin. A second question will be in multifunctionality, where we look at ferroelectric materials and a coupled electromechanical response. OK, so uh, we we'll start with magnesium. Uh, and this is a broad motivation of magnesium as a field. Those of you who have studied a little bit about magnesium would probably know this already, but this is a classic Ashby chart where you have the strength of a metallic system as a function of the density. And what you see is the density of magnesium has a very, very low value compared to most of your other structural metals. The question that industries, um, laboratories raised a few decades ago was how do I exploit this low density and extract the maximum strength of the material to improve your power to weight ratio in vehicles, in defense applications, so on and so forth. In any application that requires extremely short time scales, how would I control my material response such that I exploit this low density, but get greater dynamic strength of the material? So um, again, this is a primer on plastic deformation in hexagonal plus back materials. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, the most common plastic deformation mechanisms in metals is called a dislocation. 
And a dislocation, if you think of this as a periodic array of your atoms, right? A dislocation is basically basically disturbs that periodicity. It's essentially a, a line beam, right? So you have an extra half plane of atoms here. And when you apply a shear force or a shear stress to this medium, you move this dislocation. And in magnesium, you have an hexagonal close back crystal structure. And these dislocations typically move along specific atomic planes. And this is where things get complicated in magnesium, simply because it's much easier to drive dislocations in plane of the hexagonal crystal rather than out of plane. And these are called the pyramidal planes. So this anisotropy basically results in the kicking up of another alternate mechanism, and this is called a deformation twin. So deformation twin is nothing but a reorientation of a crystal lattice. You can think of it as a shear of a volume of lattices or a volume of atoms uh, with respect to a twin boundary. So this is now a volume defect, and I'll show that to you in a few uh, minutes. And the question is, how do, the, how do these twins, which are um, not very commonly observed in cubic methods, for example, affect the material strength of magnesium during plasticity? Hmm. Right. So this is uh, these are sequence of uh, microscope images of a deformation twin. What you see here is that the twins form lenticular bands. So this, this interface that you see is called a twin boundary. And if you zoom into this region, you're going to see that this twin boundary uh, basically is separated by a difference in crystal orientation on this side of the side. Right. So on either side of a twin boundary, you have different crystal orientations. Now, I zoom in even further, you can actually see that the crystal orientation is different. If you simply try to follow the lattice parameters here versus here, you should be able to see that. Uh, to show this to you a little more in detail, these were um, experimental images. It's called a technique called electron backscatter diffraction microscopy. The essential idea is it's done inside an electron microscope where each color refers to the crystal orientation of the lattice. Now, the specific interest in this particular experiment that we did was in being able to do this in 3D. So essentially you come in with a laser and you remove material. And as you remove material, you, you construct a three-dimensional um, surface. And what you see is these green regions are basically the deformation twins. So they form lenticular bands, but these are also volume defects and these twin boundaries are really surface defects, yes. So you come with a laser? Can you spend a yes. laser? It's a femtosecond laser that comes in at an incident cycle. And then you basically remove so maybe you first take the ESD map, you collect the microscope image, and then you remove some material, and then you just do this in a destructive fashion. Right. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions or confusion at this point? Okay. So the idea basically being that the twin is not really a line defect, or the twin boundary is not a line defect, it's really a surface defect that's propagating through your medium. So now let's ask the question: how do these deformation twins influence material strength? So I'm going to give you a simple, again, canonical experiment of uh, a projectile penetrating a, 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 a material, a metal in this case. And you zoom in, you have a collection of dislocations of twins. Now, if I simply use um, a very rudimentary argument right now at this point, where you take the net strain rate in the sample, and you basically partition that into an elastic and viscoplastic component. We do this in the tensorial form a little later. But for now, if you simply assume um, an additive decomposition of the strain rate into an elastic and viscoplastic component, uh, this viscoplastic component can be differentiated into the effect of dislocations, which are specific uh, defects that we spoke about, and twins. We know a lot about how dislocations evolve when you apply a shear stress and temperature to it. This is classic literature. It's been there for a long time. I would not say it's completely understood because the question of pressure is still an open question. But a lot of our dislocation mechanisms have been understood, which effectively means that if I volume average this effect, I have a good sense of how the strain rate due to dislocations evolve. We do not know that for deformation twins. That's exactly the question we're going to ask ourselves. How do deformation twins evolve when you apply high strain rates uh, to material? <clears throat> right. So um, before that, I'm going to start with uh, some experimental images of low strain rates. So first, let's look at what happens when you go to very, very long time scales. So this is a tensile experiment of a magnesium polycrystal inside a scanning electron microscope. So you can see the, error, the sorry, scale bar right here. And what you see is these uh, irregular lines are effectively the grain boundary. What you see is these straight lines inside the boundary are essentially the deformation twin boundaries. Right? So um, I'm going to stop talking for a few seconds so that you can just watch the movie. And what you will notice is that these boundaries simply migrate. So for a few seconds, I'm going to stop talking and let you watch uh, the data for a set for uh, some time. 
So I, was, I hope you were looking at this region, and if you weren't, maybe uh, through the rest of the slide, you can just look at this region. You can actually see where these deformation twin boundaries open up ever so slowly. The velocity of these deformation twin boundaries, essentially the surfaces that we were talking about in the previous microscope images, um, was of the order of 35 nanometers per second. So extremely slow velocity of the twin boundary growth. Now remember that the twin is a lenticular tip. The question is how fast did the tip propagate? We never saw that. The answer is that the SEM is too slow to even capture the twin tip velocities. And in our next set of experiments, we'll actually see that we were able to capture those twin tip velocities. So um, let's go back. Let's. Uh, so, what is the the so this is just a, 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 dog, a dog sample loaded in the. What is the direction? Hmm. So, happens at high strain rates. These were, sorry, um, by the way, these were experiments that were done by a former colleague of mine, even on my experiments. And so, the point is, we really can't do these kind of experiments at high strain rates simply because of limitations in time resolution. So, what we ended up doing was doing a, a classical experiment in the dynamic impact of uh, materials literature. I will, so I'm, I'm presuming that some of you do not know about this experiment, so I'll give you a brief introduction to it. The idea is you have a steel projectile, so this is a cylindrical projectile that impacts the incident bar at a given velocity. You have a stress wave that propagates through the incident bar, impacts a specimen that's sitting right here, and then goes to the transmitter bar. Right? So for those of you who have studied waves, the acoustic impedance of the sample is usually designed to be lesser than the bars so that the sample is under compression. So if I zoom in to the specimen itself, you can measure the incident and reflect it, the incident wave that comes into the sample. You can measure the reflected wave. So it goes out of the sample and the transmitted wave from the other bar. These the bars are designed to be purely elastic, which means that using either swaying gauges or interferometer based systems, you can actually measure these with excellent time resolution. Now, using simple um, wave uh, linear uh, elastic wave analysis, you can actually extract the forces and velocities on the sample edges, which means you get. Uh, a macroscopic measure of the strain rate and stresses inside the sample. So that's the data. So what you see here in the dotted line were quasi-static compression experiments. So these were cl your classic instron uh, experiments where you just do slow compression of a sample. And the red curves are at high strain rates using the Kolsky bar measurements. And what you see is as you increase the strain rate, you have an increase in the strength of the material in general. So uh, if you think of this as yield, and there's a little bit of complication in understanding yield in dynamic experiments, which we can talk about later. But if you look at this yield point, you see the yield goes up, but then the flow stresses also go up as you increase the strain rate. The question is why? Um, so to further understand this question, we ended up going and building a high-speed microscope uh, in front of the Kolsky bar. So this is actually a picture of the Kolsky bar that we use to make experiments. Uh, this was back when I did my PhD at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, this is a gas gun that fires a projectile. That's your incident bar. And then right where, you, where this camera is pointing at is a sample which you really can't see in this picture. So what we ended up doing was we had this um, state-of-the-art high-speed camera and we ended up building a microscope in front of it. We can discuss the details of the microscope. But in general, we were achieving time resolutions of 200 nanoseconds per frame and spatial resolutions of about three to five micrometers per pixel. So this was uh, state of the art in terms of the capabilities that we could visualize at the time. So um, the experimental configuration, we took a single crystal of magnesium, right? So this is the schematic of the crystal structure. Um, remember these marked planes are the planes along which things propagate, but we're really imaging the outer plane um, surface, which means all you're looking at is a projection of the deformation planes that propagate on these three dimensional surfaces. And what you're, what you're seeing here uh, in the next movie is really the high strain rate impact experiment. The total duration of the experiment in real time was 12 microseconds and the sample along the width was about 3.5 millimeters. So this is where I'm going to start talking for a little longer, let you watch the data for some time and then draw some conclusions out of it. <clears throat> So this was compression along the horizontal direction. These interfaces were the deformation twins, or these heterogeneities were the deformation twins that propagated um, at the real time total duration of 12 microseconds. <clears throat> Let it run one more time, and then we'll try, try to draw some um, conclusions about the mechanism itself. <clears throat> 
So the first thing is we notice that nucleation occurred in the sample edge. This is really an experimental artifact simply because you have a finite size of the sample. Um, and second thing is you see that there's a very fast twin tip growth. So this twin tip grows at the order of a kilometer per second. And like I said, this is why uh, the, the authors of the in-situ uh, electron microscopy study could not visualize the twin tips themselves. This is where things get interesting. So once this twin tip has reached the sample boundary, when the tip cannot grow anymore, we would expect that the boundary grows at a much slower pace. Now we measure the twin boundary velocities at 35 meters per second, which is nine orders of magnitude faster than what uh, the authors observed in the quasi-static experiment. And at close to something like 30, 35 meters per second, you have a huge amount of nucleation of these additional definition twins at the boundaries. The argument of the phenomenological the phenomenological ar argument here is that the twin boundary begins to grow. It grows at the maximum velocity that it can. It's an intrinsic time scale that's imposed by the mechanism itself or by the material itself. And at some point, you're imposing deformation on this material at a much faster rate than the twin boundary can accommodate. And so it goes to another mechanism, which is the nucleation of additional twins at the boundary. Right? Um, <clears throat> so we'll look at this in the context. Um, at, 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 we, we, went, we started going to a little more analysis of these images. We collected a lot of data and we wanted to go to a little more analysis. And for that, we go into a little bit of what's called crystal plasticity, right? And the idea is basically that you have your continuum potato and imagine this is a single crystal. You apply a definition gradient to it. And in the case where there is twin dominant definition or viscoplastic definition, you can do a scalar or a tensorial partition of this into an elastic and viscoplastic component. This is the tensorial counterpart of what we did in a very rudimentary scalar fashion before. <clears throat> so um, if you take the multiplicated decomposition of the definition gradient in elastic and viscoplastic components, the velocity gradient, which is nothing but the spatial gradient of the velocity field, will pop out to be an additive velocity gradient. So you can separate this into elastic and viscoplastic component. You define an ansatz that says that the viscoplastic velocity gradient is because of distribution of winds, and this is an ansatz again. It we could go ahead and refine how we define this additive decomposition, but for now let's just stick to this idea. And what's used in classic, classic crystal plasticity literature for the velocity gradient of a twin is that if you assume there are a lot of twins inside your system, these are discrete mechanisms, you have a shear rate due to twinning, and this is an assumption because you're assuming that the twins are purely shear dominated. Uh, this is an assumption that could come up to test at some point in the future. I don't think people have tested this enough right now. And then you have these crystallographic constants where k beta is the normal to the, sorry, k beta is the direction of shear, direction of propagation of twin, and n beta is essentially the normal to the twin boundary. And you can imagine because there are multiple conjugate planes, you have different um, uh, twin variants as per se that can uh, grow. So why did we go into this whole process? Because the shear rate term that we're talking about here which is used in classic literature is basically defined as a volume fraction rate of the twins and a crystallographic constant that is the reorientation of the crystal lattice during twinning that we talked about. And now we can use our experimental data to extract this information to understand a little more quantitatively how we can understand nucleation and growth. So we can just use simple geometric analysis I've not given you details here. Uh, but if you take this volume fraction rate of twin evolution, you can separate this into the nucleation rate, rate, where rho dot is effectively the number density of these discrete twins inside your system. And then you have a growth term where L dot and W dot, L dot is a twin tip velocity, so that's how fast the twin length increases, and W dot is how fast the twin width increases. So you can basically lump all this into a nucleation term, which is the number of twins that nucleate at every image from an experimental standpoint, and a growth term, which basically defines how fast existing twins grow. Because you can imagine that the forces required to drive nucleation of additional twins is very different from what's required to drive growth. Hmm. So then we went ahead and did some quantitative image processing, and we'll explain this plot to you. On the left axis, you have the twin volume fraction. This is all from experimental data. And this is the time since start of loading in microseconds. And the blue curve, which is on the right, is the number of twins, the number density of twins during definition, right? So you can see that already at about eight microseconds is when the, the loading starts. You have an increase in the twin volume fraction, but not a lot of twin number densities. This is when you have very fast growth of these first twins that nucleate inside your system. 
But very soon you have an increase in the nucleation rate. So you have a huge increase of the slope of the grid number density as a function of time. Right. So essentially, this is the quantitative confirmation of what we saw before that you have greater nucleation when you go to high strain rate loading. So um, I'm, I'm going to close this part of the talk with an outlook of where uh, I, I feel we have open questions that can be answered both experimentally and theoretically. Uh, we've already shown that when you have long time scales, you have growth, which is dominant. So this is a plot of the rate of growth of twins as a function of the rate of nucleation of twins. And this is where nucleation and growth rates are com uh, comparable or equal. Um, and long time scales, we saw qualitatively that you have a lot of growth and very little nucleation. While short time scales in our experiments, we saw that you could be run into a nucleation dominant deformation. So if I recast this rate of change of twin volume fraction, simply as a function of driving forces. We don't know what these driving forces are just yet, but imagine that the rate of nucleation is a function of stress and temperature and so on and so forth. Uh, the rate of twin growth is stress, temperature, and your internal field. So imagine you have a twin tip that's growing inside a medium, which is plastically deforming. So now it's like crack at its You're talking about a crack that's propagating inside a plastically deforming medium. Your driving forces on the crack are altered. And the question is, how do we go ahead and simply use theory and experiment to find these kinetic laws for these interfaces. And this is where we go into some classic um, uh, theoretical literature from phase boundary kinetics. Um, and the idea basically is asking the question, what drives a twin boundary? So we know from classic uh, analysis from Abel and Knowles and even from um, uh, theories before that, that you can define the jump or the thermodynamic driving force on an interface as a jump in present field. In this case, it's simply a jump in the free energy enthalpy and the average of the stress density definition gradient. Right? This is in a purely mechanical problem. And the next question is how fast it grows. We can actually measure this velocity as we've shown in our experiments. The question is can we actually extract these thermodynamic driving forces from experiments? And the answer is yes. People have not done this, have not spent too much time on it, in, in, in my opinion. But I think there's a lot more we can do with the range of high resolution thermomechanical measurements that we can make at small length scales and small time scales simultaneously. And we'll touch upon the types of methods that we can use towards the end. Right? So uh, we've shown something about these interfaces and how they evolve as a function of time scales um, and potential directions in, in being able to rigorously understand the competition between nucleation and growth as a function of strain. Uh, we now touch upon another problem, which is yes. I have a couple of questions on this last yes. aspect. So in your rate law, you are not taking the propagation is so fast that you don't even need to consider it. The... That depends on the time scales of loading, right? So we're talking about nanosecond time scales of propagation. So if you're talking about a quasi-static experiment, sure, correct. But then let's say I am applying loading in the time scale of nanoseconds. So just to understand, in your equation, it does not figure, so you're not considering it. You're assuming it's fast. No, no, the L dot is essentially that. That's the twin tip growth, right? Ah, the TT is twin tip. Yeah, that's twin tip growth, and this is twin boundary growth. Yes. So the L dot is the is the rate of tip tip growth, and this is the W okay. rate of twin boundaries that you showed were coherent boundaries, sigma three type or four. we have not done that analysis to be honest. Um, there has been evidence from other studies that say that they're not necessarily coherent. And in fact, the structure of the twin boundary could actually be a function of how fast you load them. So, so in, the sense, in the case of coherent twin boundaries, mm -hmm. there would be no jump across your interface in the stress field, right? Uh, no, but then the question, the, the point is also that when you have a different different crystal orientation on two sides of the boundary, you also have a difference in plasticity across the boundary, simply because of the fact that you have, um, so once you have a twin boundary, if you're applying a macroscopic stress in the vertical direction, you're actually applying, you're generating different types of dislocation in this crystal and in the twin crystal. Which means that this is not sufficient to describe a jump force. You will actually have a difference in dissipation across the interface. So, how do you define jump? Jump in the normal component? It's the normal component. This is the jump. Normal, normal to the interface. Normal to the interface? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? So the driving force that again was derived was the strength of the elasticity. 
In, in, in this case, so this is this is simply a hypothetical presentation. So I have, I have actually not done the experiments to extract uh, driving force. So the expectation is that this will not be sufficient, like I was just talking about. You have to need you need another term which basically describes dislocation mediated plastic deformation in the in the matrix in between, and that's going to be different. That complicates the problem a little further. So it's not purely elastic inside the different phases. Okay. Uh, so maybe I go ahead and then if you have questions, we can talk about it. Uh, about 15 minutes more. Yes. So uh, we're going to be talking about a different problem. It's, it's, it's seemingly going to be very different from what we've been talking about all this time, but I try to bring a parallel in terms of microstructure and genetics uh, in, in the context of electromechanical response. So we're talking about ferroelectric materials. And for those who don't know, the ferroelectric material is characterized by a permanent electrical polarization in a particular direction. And when you apply a large amplitude electric field opposite to this permanent electrical dipole, you switch this, right? The switching is essentially nonlinear and dissipative, which results in, uh, which basically results in uh, an electrical hysteresis and a coupled mechanical actuation strip. So this is a thermoelectromechanical coupled problem. And you can imagine the application to this range from transducers to active structures. And more recently, it's actually been exploited at the nanoscale to look at memory storage and uh, actually memory storage is a little older, but the most recent one that I've heard about is in nanoelectronics. So essentially design the material to be a nanoelectronic circuit um, because of these dissipation processes. Um, so how do you understand this problem? If you look at the structure of the crystal, you typically have a, per a perovskite structure, which is what we call as ABO3. You have positive ions at the corners of the unit cell. You have a, a, a body center, heavy positive ion, and then you have oxygen ions to the base When you reduce the temperature below what's called the Curie temperature, which is basically the idea from thermagnetics, uh, you have separation of the center of the positive and negative charges, resulting in a permanent electrical dipole. And that also results in your double potential right here. So essentially, in a one dimensional setting, you can imagine that you have two stable states for positive and negative polarization because this is um, a polar. Uh, phase. So what happens when I apply an electric field? So imagine I'm, I'm applying an electric field towards a particular direction. You tilt your um, double well potential, like we discussed at the start of this talk. In this case, you tilt it towards a particular polarization, and so you drive uh, deformation of the material towards a particular direction of polarization. Right. So at the macroscopic scale, you're applying electric field on the x-axis, and you're measuring the electrical displacement on the y-axis. And you have a hysterical response. What's interesting to us in the mechanics of materials community is intermediate scale. So this is an actual experimental image of a ferroelectric sample. This is the time The scale bar is about two micrometers. And what you see is you have these heterogeneous regions, which are separated by differences in polarization. These are called domains, and the interfaces are called domain walls. So now we're already seeing an analog to the mechanical problem we were talking about before. So um, what happens when I apply an electric field, you basically have the motion of these domain walls to result in a homogeneous crystal. This is, of course, in a very idealistic setting. But the idea is essentially to understand energy conversion in these materials from the context of how fast these interfaces propagate inside. The problem is obviously never as simple as the cartoon of showing you that's the whole point of cartoons. Uh, so um, I'm going to show you some experiments that we did at macroscopic length scales. We really have not done these two microscopic measurements because they're very complex at this point. But what we use is we use an experiment called broadband electromechanical spectroscopy. The idea is you have a ferroelectric sample, which is shaped like a cantilever beam. Uh, it has a length of about 40 millimeters, a thickness of about one millimeter, and a width of three millimeters. You apply electrodes on the surface of the sample, and you apply high voltages across the surface of the sample. Right. You measure the electrical displacement or you measure the charges on the sample using a charge amplifier circuit. Um, and using a speckle pattern that I've not shown you in this, in this picture, you can actually measure the strain fields of the sample during the application of large amplitude electric fields. So this is a picture of the experiment in our lab at EDH. Um, so this is a sample that I was talking to you about. These are high voltage cables that, that basically apply voltages to the sample. Um, because of the speed and the problem you see, but if you actually look carefully, you should see the speckle pattern on the surface of the sample. <laughs> These are the two cameras that I use to measure the strain phase on the surface. 
And this is an example of um, deformation map where you measure the outer plane deformation fields on the surface of the sample. Right? So this is an example data set. The blue curve here is the applied electric field to the sample. The red curve is a measured electrical displacement. This is over a span of about 1,000 seconds. So this is a very, very slow experiment. And what you're seeing here is the in situ uh, surface average strain that we measure on the surface of the sample purely during the application of electric field. So this is, this is assumed to be a stress-free experiment. Um, so again, if you plot the electrical displacement as a function of the electric field, you have this white curve, which is effectively your electrical hysteresis. And the slope of this white curve is what we call apparent permittivity. At the linear um, level, when you simply have the piezoelectric effect, you can simply talk about this as a permittivity of the material. But then when you have switching, you have a huge peak, which is a measure of how fast the material switches as a function of the applied electric field, right? In other words, uh, it's a macroscopic analog for the mobility of ferroelectrics. Um, another metric that we'll be talking about is coercive field. I know it's a fairly contested terminology in the area, but here we're just using the coercive field as a measure of the driving force or at maximum rate of polarization switching. So imagine you have the electric field or the electrical displacement that's switching at a really fast rate. And when there is a maximum rate of polarization switching, uh, you measure that as the driving force for this evolution. So um, this is again a repeat of the microstructure. You can see that you have a huge density of domain walls when you start the experiment. So this is when you start the scientific experiment. Um, and what I'm going to show you is data at different rates. So the question is, what happens when you go to very short time scales? So here, this is a frequency of two times 10 to the minus three hertz. And as I increase the rate, the first thing you'll see is the difference in polarization, the difference in electric displacement keeps going down. <coughs> as I increase the frequency an order of magnitude higher, you'll see that the apparent permittivity, which is the mobility of uh, switching, begins to go down as well. So that's the peak of this curve, right? What this means is that I'm trying to drive electrical switching in the material by applying electric field, but the material is reluctant to switch its polarization. And as I keep increasing this, you'll see that the symmetry of the history slope is changing, as well as the net change in polarization and zero electric field and the mobility of polarization. So let, let's look at this a little more quantitatively. This is the x-axis is frequency and the remnant polarization and the saturation polarization. So these are the polarizations at zero and maximum electric fields. They go down significantly as a function of frequency. Secondly, if I look at the coercive field, and this is for different, different directions of loading, but now let's just look at the negative direction, which is the white dots, you see there's a drastic increase in the coercive field as you increase the rate of loading, as you increase the cycling frequency. And what this means is that it becomes harder to drive these domain walls or these domains as you increase your um, rate of electric field. And thirdly, the apparent probability, that's the mobility of switching. So if you think of this as the ratio between the rate of change of polarization and uh, or the slope of the rate of change of polarization with the applied driving force. And that decreases by almost 40 percent as you go a few orders of magnitude and frequency. And the question that we're trying to answer right now, and, and at this point we have more questions than we have answers because this is work in progress, is why do we have this decrease in mobility as you increase the loading rate? And we have ideas from our previous experiments and from studies that exist in literature about uh, the motion of walls. And we might we probably have some time to discuss that uh, in the next few minutes. Right? So um, the first thing we have to talk about is uh, what are these microscopic domain wall configurations? Like I said, we do not have in situ measurements. We, do, we are not able to measure the evolution of the microstructure during the application of the electric field, uh, but we can make some guesses, some intelligent or I wouldn't say intelligent, but we can make some informed guesses using the macroscopic data that we have, right? So typically when you have a domain wall that's separated by 180 degrees of the polarization, so that's called a 180 degree wall, or if the polarization on either side of a single domain wall is 90 degrees, you call it a 90 degree domain wall. Now, if you know that you have only specific types of domains that can exist in your system, you can present any field as a volume average of the volume fraction of specific domains Times that particular field. And this is exactly what we measure, right? So imagine you're measuring the electrical displacement. You're measuring the volume average of electrical displacement in our sample. 
and that can be separated into a linear component, which is simply a dielectric effect times the polarization switching effect. And what we measure the strain becomes interesting because now when you're measuring the average strain in the sample, you have a piezoelectric effect, which is simply the inverse uh, piezoelectric coefficient. And then you have your transformation strain. And this transformation strain becomes interesting because this is a strain that's involved when you have a reorientation or a change in the polarization inside a given domain. It so turns out that this epsilon d is finite only for 90 degree domains, but not for 180 degree domains. So if you're actually looking at the evolution of strain as a function of frequency, you get a sense of um, which of these uh, mechanisms dominate during uh, switching at short time scales. The basic idea is if my strain is going down as a function of frequency, this strain is only a function of your uh, 90 degree domain wall activity. There are caveats to this argument, which we can discuss about later. But the idea is as you increase the frequency, the mobility of these 90 degree domain walls are going down. So that's a hypothesis that we have right now. There's still a lot more testing that we need to do um, in terms of confirming this hypothesis. Some of which we have. So uh, let's pull out. We've seen some data. We've seen how polarization evolves as a function of rate. We've seen how strains evolve as a function of rate. And uh, in a very simplistic argument, what we're saying is if I have a material, right? So imagine the red region is a particular polarization, the black is another polarization. You're applying an electric field, which means that the domain wall is moving because it's, it's being driven towards a particular direction. Now, typically, this is defined using what's called allen fine kinetics, which is, um, which is which is essentially the gradient, uh, it uses the gradient descent of your free energy density. Uh, but the essential idea is here. So the velocity of the domain wall is governed by a driving force. It's very similar, analogous to the, to the argument we had with the Quirin problem. And this imposes a particular time scale to the electromechanical response of the material. So what happens when we exceed this particular time scale? So imagine that this uh, rate of change of polarization is defined by a globe term or an integration term, very similar to what we did in the winning problem. And when you exceed the, the, the time scale that allows for growth of the domain wall, it typically has implications. That's an expectation at this point. So um, the questions that we're trying to ask ourselves is, can we first describe these non equilibrium kinetics? Can we describe these non linear kinetic relations when you go to short time scales? And can we actually describe when there is a transition from a growth dominant to an inflation dominant term? So these are open questions right now that we don't have answers to. We're designing experiments um, <clears throat> uh, to attempt to visualize these domain walls at very short length scales as well. Uh, but this is really work in progress and the story for another time. We are in, uh, it's essentially a stress free boundary condition because it's a freestanding mechanical equilibrium. Um, are we in mechanical equilibrium? Maybe not at the very short time scales, but um, I don't think we've tested it. And I, I, I don't, I can't think of a good enough test for that test as yet. But, um, what is your free energy here is a function of polarization of the field? It will depend on the strain as well. It will depend on the mechanical. But here is just a, oh, it's just a representation, but then it will depend on temperature field. It will depend on mechanical bond functions for mechanical stress. So if it depends on your mechanical stress, then I'm seeing that your equation is driven by a field formulation, which is dissipated. From the get go, would you be able to capture elasticity properly in that case? In the model? Yes, because you are, as soon as you apply a force on the system or any, any mechanical bond condition, this thing is going to move, right? Yes, it will. I mean, it, so this is a dissipative process. Right. This is a dissipative process, but we don't really know what this is, right? I mean, this is just a, a presentation of the idea. We don't really know what the, the kinetic relation is. So, I mean, in the experiment, yes, it will drive it. When you say phase field, I think we're, we're assuming that we're running a calculation with phase field simulations. That's not true. It's simply looking at this from a sharp interface standpoint. Yes, this is what is used in literature. Yes. And there you would expect the domain wall to move when you apply the camera. Yes, so my question is does it make sense in the case where you apply just an elastic deformation to the system mm -hmm. and this thing moves? Is that normal? Yes, yes, it is. Um, it depends on the amplitude of mechanical force that you apply, right? I mean, we're talking, we're not so talking about the elastic 
Christian So these are ceramics, crystals. Don't really talk about plasticity as much in these materials, but at small amplitude fields, no, you wouldn't have the motion of the of the um, of the domain wall. However, if you apply a mechanical constraint, for example, and then apply an electric field, you will have a different uh, velocity of the domain wall simply because it imposes a difference in uh, in driving forces of the domain wall. Mm -hmm. So there's a stopping criteria some so there's a yes, yes, absolutely. trigger somewhere which says that do not move until you reach this point. Yes, you will have a critical force if you may for when the domain wall begins to move. And again, that's up for testing. I don't think I think there are studies, and Lauren is a, be, is, a, is a better expert at this than I am, which says that there is a stopping driving electric field, a stick slip type motion at some point. Uh, but we don't have very good measures of that just yet. Um, is, is there anything else or maybe <coughs> maybe I'll skip this part. This is actually a protocol that we define um, to go ahead and attempt to answer these questions from a microscopic standpoint. I won't go into this in detail because it's just going to get a little more complicated. Um, so I'll, I'll go out of the talk. Yeah. I'll pull out of the talk with uh, with a, a broad view of where I think the field should go. Again, this is a personal perspective, and I'd be happy to have debates with anyone who'd like to about this. Um, the idea is essentially to go ahead and develop experimental protocols, and this is again from an experimental standpoint. It's to go and develop experimental protocols that connect ideas of defect kinetics to macroscopic thermoelectromechanical experiments. You have a broad range of experiments that you can perform at short time scales. These are um, Polsky bars where you can apply complex stress states at very short time scales. Um, these are experiments that we're actually working on in ETS right now, where you apply multi physical fields, uh, temperature, mechanical stresses, uh, electric fields, exa example. Um, and this is a specifically interesting example that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and this is an idea where you basically have a sample and then you apply a large amplitude laser pulse, <coughs> really short, large amplitude laser pulse with different shock waves inside the sample. So this way you generate um, a, a high pressure, a high mechanical pressure inside a sample. So if you imagine you have one of these parallel uh, <coughs> samples inside this, you could actually probe the mechanical response at different states of polarization. We've made a lot of inroads into how we can measure small scale fields. So this is an example that we spoke about in fair detail today. This is an example of looking at the stress field around a propagating crack at very fast velocities. We're talking about Velocities faster than shear wave speeds. <laughs> and here is a specific example that we are probing into, which allows us to look at the spatially resolved polarization vectors um, during applications of multi physical. <laughs> so you can imagine combining macroscopic stimuli and microscopic measurements that allows us to extract better versions of or much more robust understanding of these kinetic laws that drive interfaces in materials. And this goes across. So what I'm going to do is end with a thought experiment here that, uh, um, again, it's a thought experiment. I don't think anyone has done this before. But the idea is if you take a sample which has an electrical polarization and you apply a velocity boundary condition to the sample, imagine a plate impact experiment where you have two plates. One is a piezoelectric sample and another plate impacts it. You basically generate charges at very short time scale. This is the idea of the explosive generator we, talk, what we talked about earlier. Now, the question for this energy generator, if you may, is can I control my output energy density, whether this is electric field, whether this is voltage current, or for that matter, the ability to damp high amplitude stress waves, by controlling the microscopic uh, distribution of interfaces inside my medium. Right? Again, this is an open question. We go back and ask ourselves the same questions. How do we actually understand what drives these defects? And secondly, how do we understand how fast this interface grow? Um, the science here is in basically developing high resolution measurements at different length and times, especially at the short time scales that allow us to look at these non equilibrium phenomena. And the material design question is can we actually control the material at these mesoscopic length scales where we understand interfacial kinetics to control the output energy density? In, in the case of the energy generator, it's how much of energy can I generate? In the case of a material that's protected, how much of energy can I absorb? Right. So this is a broad question that I have been thinking about for what I want to do in the future, and I hope I can get a lot of uh, ideas and discussions from the experts in the audience.
Um, so since I'm running out of time, I'll put up on my uh, closing sure. We looked at a defamation winning problem where you have plasticity that's governed at short time scales. Um, and the plastic strength of this material, the strength of the material during plastic deformation is governed by the transition to nucleation to growth of specific interfacial defects. We looked at a second problem with electromechanical response of ferroelectrics, where we have macroscopic ideas of how um, the response of the material evolves as a function of time scale, but we're still looking at how we can extract information at the small length scales, at domain wall length scales. And we also looked at a little bit about where I think the future of mechanics at for the short time scales uh, is moving towards. And of course, I'd be happy to have discussions on this. Uh, so uh, thank you all for the attention, for the questions during the talk. And uh, if there are any more questions, I'd be happy to answer.